The Lord be with you. Gathered together this morning, the seventh Sunday after the day of Pentecost, our order of service this morning, divine service setting four, found on page 203 in the Lutheran service books. We worship together using the outline on the side of the bulletin here. Welcome to guests and visitors that have gathered with us this morning. We ask that you take a look at the inside of the front cover. We have a note addressed specially to you. And for those who will be communing with us this morning, those members of Emmanuel, members of other Missouri Synod Lutheran congregations, please reminder to place the registration cards that you find in the pew rack in front of you here in the basket as you come forward for Holy Communion. Let us worship together now with our opening hymn, hymn 901, Open Now Thy Gates of Beauty. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered, 
to hear God's word, to call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us seek refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. For his sake, he forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. As for man, his days are like grass, he flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him, and His righteousness to children's children, to those who keep His covenant, and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, since you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the seventh Sunday after Pentecost is from Isaiah chapter 55. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. In it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading is from Romans chapter 8. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Please stand as we greet the Holy Gospel with the Alleluia and verse. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on the rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. 
Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. We respond with our confession of faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And as he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for the hymn of the day. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. The word of our Lord that serves as a foundation for our sermon is our reading from Romans chapter 8, especially verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Please be seated. Three readings from Romans chapter 8. For the next three weeks, we'll hear three readings from Romans here in chapter 8 and consider them for our sermon series throughout the summer months of the season of Pentecost. Romans chapter 8, what a wonderful chapter of the Bible. As I heard one person put it recently, all is great in Romans 8. 
There are lots of memorable passages in this chapter. Just consider how the chapter begins there with the truth that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What comfort, what good news for those who are distraught over their sins, who are guilt-ridden. And that's how the chapter begins. And then in the middle, we have those wonderful passages about the Holy Spirit that helps us when we don't know what to pray for. The Spirit there is groaning. Pray with us, it says, with groanings too deep for words. And there's those words in the middle of the chapter about being conformed to the image of the Son of Jesus. And of course, we can't forget about the conclusion of the chapter where the Apostle Paul claims that we are more than conquerors through through Jesus, through God and his love, and that there is nothing that is able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And Paul gives a huge list. Neither death nor life nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us. What wonderful words, what good news, what comfort there at the conclusion of chapter 8 of Romans for those who are questioning whether or not God is truly in control of this world, of this life. Yes, indeed, all is great. And Romans 8, indeed, a great chapter of the Bible. And so for the next three weeks, We're going to try to connect these three readings from Romans chapter 8 together with an overarching theme that will guide us through the chapter. And the theme is all in, all in. We use words and ideas from each of these passages that we have for the next three weeks. And under the theme all in, consider all of creation all things, and for today, for our time this morning, all in the family. And St. Paul writes in this portion of chapter 8 that we have before us today, that we behold God's people are all in, all in the family as children of God. And so what I'd like to do for this short time that we have together in our sermon is consider exactly what St. Paul means when he claims that all of us as Christians are in a family, in the family of God, as children of God. What does it mean to be a child of God according to Romans 8? And what's the benefit? What's the benefit for my life now and today? Well, St. Paul I suggest, gives us a threefold definition of a child of God from this morning's portion of Romans 8. He says three things here, and it'll kind of help us structure our sermon. To be a child of God is to be led by the Spirit. And to be a child of God is to live as a son or a daughter. And to be a child of God is to rejoice as an heir of God and a fellow heir with Christ. St. Paul proclaims the beginning of our passage this morning that God's children are led by the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God that is active through the Word of God, makes it a living Word that produces living things as we heard in our reading from Isaiah, the Word of God that does not return void just as rain comes down and waters the earth and bears fruit so too the word of God does not return void, just like in our reading in the parable of the seed and the sower. The word of God accomplishes things when it is sown in the good soil, does not return void. And so to take up Paul's question in our epistle reading, what does it mean to be a child of God? We can proclaim first and foremost to be a child of God is to be alive, to be alive by the Spirit of God in Christ, as it has worked through the living word in your life and in mine. A child of God that has received faith in the living word that makes bold, life-giving promises to you. A child of God that has been pardoned and forgiven by the blood of Jesus that covers all of your sin. And a child of God that has been crucified with Christ brought to new life in Christ now. So a child of God then lives in the spirit of Christ, led by the spirit and not by the desires of the flesh, those every impulses that are active in our lives that so often lead us 
as we considered last week from Romans 7 to do the very things that we know we do not want to do and are against God's word. Rather, a child of God is led by the Spirit. We've been born again by the water and the Spirit, the Spirit that leads you to cry in your prayers, in your praises, Abba, Father, and to confess Jesus Christ as Lord, led by the Spirit, receiving the life-giving body and blood of Jesus Christ, your brother. In these ways, you and I are children of God alive in Jesus, part of the family of God, the life-giving, Spirit-filled Word of God has not returned void, and it has indeed accomplished the purpose for which it was sent into your life. So to be a child of God is to be led by the Spirit. And the Apostle Paul reminds us in our reading that to be a child of God means that you are a son, that you are a daughter. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. Some of us might groan at that idea, right, as we look around. Sons and daughters, brothers and sisters in Christ, part of the family of God, all in the family, led by the Spirit. Sons and daughters, again, not led by the impulses and desires of the world. Sons and daughters of God in Christ do not then get their cue about what to do from the latest Netflix show or the popular TikTok video, or the fresh advertisement from a celebrity that scrolls across your social media feed or interrupts your YouTube video, no sons and daughters in Christ led by the Spirit, and so do not even look primarily to media or politicians to decide what to do or to think. As St. Paul says, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For we are led by the Spirit of God as children of God. For we did not receive, Paul says, a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but we received the spirit of adoption as sons, as daughters. The Spirit himself that bears witness with our spirit that we, we, all of us, are children of God. God has purchased your birthright. God has done it, not with gold or silver, but with the holy, precious blood, the innocent suffering and death of his beloved son. And so like that younger son in the parable of the prodigal son, we come before our father led by the spirit even each day in repentance as sons and daughters. God who has graciously received us into his house as baptized children. And if then you are a child of God as a son or a daughter led by the Spirit, then you can also rejoice now as an heir of God and a fellow heir with Christ. To be an heir is, in many ways, to ask a specific question. And the question is this, what do I get, right? If I'm an heir, that's how it is in this life, right? If I'm an heir, well, what do I get? And sometimes in this life, it can get, the answer to that question and how we go about it can get pretty messy at times. But if we are to ask that question, God, what do we get as heirs? The answer is overwhelming. As a child of God, now led by the Spirit as a son or a daughter in Christ, we have a rich inheritance in the kingdom of God now. We have a land, a land that we live in now in Christ by God's grace, but a land we look forward to in the life to come called the new heavens and the new earth, a new Eden, a place we call the household of God with Many rooms where God in Christ has prepared that place for us with his crucifixion, his death, his resurrection. We have a feast, a feast to look forward to, marriage feast of the lamb and his kingdom, and a life 
an eternal life of peace and joy where there's no longer any suffering or sickness or disease or ailments and death is swallowed up in victory an inheritance in the kingdom of God now even as a son and a daughter in Christ suffers here with Christ awaiting that full glory at his return until that time Children of God receive and enjoy the down payment of life in the spirit of God, of life in Christ, in all that that means for our lives today. About a year and a half ago, you might recall, I don't know, maybe not, but about a year and a half ago, I preached a sermon on the prodigal son and Luke chapter 15 for the fourth Sunday in Lent. And I made a reference at that time to a painting of the prodigal son by the famous painter Rembrandt. And I mentioned to you then that the way Rembrandt painted the younger son's body, the prodigal son, the way he painted the younger son's body tells the story of that son's licentious life. So the painting has the sun coming back and it's that moment in the parable. Rembrandt captures that moment where he returns in repentance led by the spirit of God and coming back not as a slave but as a child back into the household of God. And the father is holding and resting his hands over the son in a sign of pardon and forgiveness and peace. And yes, the son's body tells the story of his licentious life. He's only wearing one shoe. His bare foot is cracked. His clothes are tattered and torn and his head is shaved bald. And some might suggest and have suggested that the shaved head signifies repentance, a common act, common act of repentance and mourning in the Bible, a shaved head. But as one interpreter suggests, perhaps Rembrandt is trying to communicate another truth by painting the younger son with a shaved head. Perhaps it's meant to look like that of a newborn child, one who has been born again by the water and the spirit one who has entered the kingdom of God as a child of God, one who is led by the spirit and alive in Christ, one like you who is all in the family of God as a son and a daughter, as an heir and a fellow heir with Christ, trusting in God the Father as children of God in Christ. So what I'd like us to do is stand and I'd like us to do that right now, concluding our sermon here, trusting together God the Father as children of God. Please stand. I'd like us to do that in a very familiar way. We'll do it again here later in the service for communion. But I think it's appropriate now for us to pray the Lord's Prayer together as children of God led by the Spirit of God, trusting in our Father. We are bold to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Please remain standing as we continue with the prayer of the church. We pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, you sent forth your word 
as abundantly as Isaiah says, as rains as it rains upon the earth. Grant that we would never take your generosity for granted, but would seek help and refreshment of your word in every circumstance. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of life, continue to sow your word through the fields of the earth. Bless pastors and missionaries as they proclaim your truth. Prepare the hearts of all who hear to believe and yield abundant fruit. We pray for the missionaries we have listed in our prayers, the Malbergs, the Neuendorfs, the Zabodis. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, bless parents with faithfulness as they plant your word with, in their homes and with their children, that they may grow steadfast among the cares and troubles of this world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, look with mercy upon those who suffer from illness or body or mind. We pray for Rachel, for Cecily, for Brian, for Sylvia. We pray for Annette, Craig Pop's mother, who is in hospice now. We pray for the residents and staff at Effie's Place and for those in the southern parts of the United States, the Southwest, who are experiencing heat wave. Pray for safety amid those conditions. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, your spirit calls us by the gospel to the new life of faith. We praise you and acknowledge you as our Lord. Deliver us from the devil's temptations that we may live under you and serve you in righteousness and innocence and blessedness. Through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death, that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity. All who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve who ate the forbidden fruit. You justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us again as we pray in his name. And as he has taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Welcome to the Lord's table, the body of Christ given for you, the body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. The blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sin. The body and blood of Jesus strengthen and preserve you in body and soul now and to life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen.
Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated for the closing hymn.